horror and surprises go hand in hand, as often the best scares are the ones that you never see coming. But to truly surprise in the modern age, it requires filmmakers to craft on-screen moments that come completely out of left field and leave viewers asking themselves what on earth they just witnessed, and not always for the right reasons. I'm Josh from WhatCulture.com and these are the 29 biggest WTF moments in horror. Sentence to Darkness, Wrong Turn 2021. Wrong Turn 2021 is a pretty weird movie. The reboot offers a decidedly different take on the mutated hillbilly cannibal in the woods story that the series has coasted on previously. And while the execution isn't perfect, there are some genuinely effective scares in there. The biggest WTF moment comes towards the end though, after our heroes have been put on trial by the villains of the piece. Sentenced to suffer the darkness, the remaining survivors are just about to succumb to this fate, which involves having their eyes poked out and then thrown into a pitch black cave to live out the remainder of their lives as animals, before they suddenly make a last ditch effort to prove that they could actually be useful to the tribe and don't deserve this punishment. Later on though we do actually get to see up close and personal just what happened to previous victims that were given this punishment. Put simply, they have essentially turned into zombies, they've gone mad, they're practically naked, and they're feasting on rats that they're able to grab hold of in the dark. It's a proper ghastly scene, and a real gory jaw dropper of a moment, and in another relatively bland movie. Gabriel is on Madison's brain, malignant. If you can't tell by the sheer amount of times this film has come up recently in other lists, James Wan's Malignant is a horror that's going to be talked about for a long, long time. That's partly because, whether you like it or you don't, it is undeniably full of WTF moments, from the absolute crazed opening to the many, many plot twists along the way. The biggest of these, however, comes just as the third act is kicking in. Protagonist Madison has been falsely imprisoned on account of murders committed by her supernatural brother Gabriel. It turns out, however, that the police weren't entirely wrong. Gabriel and Madison are two different people, but they just so happen to be sharing the same body. This whole time, Gabriel has been living on Madison's brain, taking over her body to live out his twisted revenge fantasy. This already bat crap twist is delivered in an equally insane way, as viewers are treated to Gabriel going on a full on killing spree in the prison, mixing the brutal violence of Mortal Kombat with the choreographed action of The Matrix. It's, it's totally wild. We're in space and we're clones, Oxygen. Oxygen was one of 2021's most pleasant surprises. While director Alexandra Arja usually dabbles in ultraviolence on a big scale, his latest is a chamber piece, following a woman who wakes up trapped in a medical pod and running out of oxygen. The whole film centers not only on how she can figure out the sci-fi tech to escape the pod, but also why she's there in the first place. I mean, who is she? Where is she? Is she dying? Does she have any family? What year is it? All of these questions and more are answered over the course of the tight 101 minutes, but it's the reveal of exactly where the pod is that gives viewers the biggest surprise of the lot. See, while you might have assumed that the woman was locked in a hospital somewhere, maybe even against her will, it turns out that no, she's actually hurtling through space. She's in one of many pods, most of which have failed due to an accident, currently on a space flight, and oh, if that's not enough, our hero is also a clone. What's even crazier is that I haven't even spoiled all the twists in this movie, it just, it just keeps going. Ed has a heart attack, The Conjuring The Devil Made Me Do It. The long-awaited third Conjuring movie was a bit of a disappointment. It certainly lacked James Wan's directorial prowess, but it wasn't a total wash. I mean, after all, Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga are so charming as Ed and Lorraine Warren that a lot of fans, including myself, would probably just happily watch them read the Spirit phone book. Still, few expected The Devil Made Me Do It to properly shake up the formula. However, the introduction does subvert expectations quite considerably by having a demon give old Ed a heart attack during an exorcism gone wrong. This isn't just brushed off either. For the rest of the flick, Ed is at a serious disadvantage, unable to contribute in the same way that he could in previous movies due to his damaged health. It flips the dynamic of his marriage as well, and for the first time in a long time in the series, allows the main character's peril to feel genuine. The nerd is brutally murdered, Fear Street 1978. Initially incorrectly written off as another lazy, nostalgia-baiting throwback horror, by me anyway, the Fear Street trilogy proved to be a nice surprise. It dabbled in the regular slasher tropes, but had plenty of surprises of its own. The WTF moment in question though comes in the second flick, the Friday the 13th pastiche Fear Street 1978, and it isn't a major plot reveal, but a regular old kill that's just so shocking in its brutality. As the axe murderer has started his spree, we pick up with some red shirts around the camp, including one Jerry. 
Jeremy. The designated nerd of the group, poor Jez is bullied by his cooler campgoers, verbally berated, and then egged. He's down on his luck, as you might guess, and then to make things worse, the killer just turns up at his doorstep. Now, at this point, you might think, well, Jeremy has been through enough. He's covered in York. Maybe, just maybe, the axe-wielding maniac will take pity on him. Well, not in this movie. Instead, Jeremy is brutally hacked to bits, getting one of the most undeserved deaths in the trilogy. The final video nasty, Censor. A period piece following a BBFC censor at the height of the UK's video nasties moral panic, it's an evocative haunting movie with an ending that's particularly powerful. Our protagonist Enid has made it her mission to eradicate gory movies from circulation, traumatised by the disappearance of her sister at a young age. Quite quickly, it becomes apparent that this censorious obsession comes from a place of mental illness though, as Enid believes that some of the VHS tapes have supernatural powers and that her missing sister is actually an actress being forced to perform in these exploitation flicks. The jaw-dropper of an ending sees the censor invade a night shoot where her quote-unquote sister is currently filming her final role. This is where things get weird, as censor itself transforms into one of these video nasties, as the aspect ratio slowly shrinks and the film stock gets grainier. Enid is giving in to her delusion that she's no longer on a film set, but actually a real-life final girl saving her sister from murderous filmmakers. The movie ends with a terrifying final scene Scene that crosscuts between the happy ending that Enid has constructed for herself in her mind and the true reality of the situation, that she's had a mental breakdown, killed a movie crew, and then kidnapped the lead actress. The Sudden End, A Quiet Place Part 2 While most of the entries on this list have been welcome WTF moments, this one is a little bit different. A Quiet Place Part 2 is a good movie. It's a worthy, more action-focused follow-up to the original, but it's also lean to a fault. The story is pretty simple. One group of heroes investigates a radio broadcast that could belong to a sanctuary untouched by the alien menace, and another stays at home base to look after the new baby. The former group, made up of Killian Murphy's newcomer Emmett and Millicent Simmons' Reagan, make it to the source of the radio signal and do indeed discover a community of humans living in relative peace. The only person we really get to know there though is Jaiman Hansu's unnamed character. The idea of having this safe haven opens up a whole bunch of new possibilities for the franchise, but sadly they're all swept under the rug as quickly as they're brought up. That's because immediately after it's introduced, an alien decimates this entire village and without even getting a name, Hansu's character is equally unceremoniously killed off. Shortly after that, the entire film comes to an abrupt end too, with our heroes still separated. So what happened here? It's like the filmmakers ran out of time and just wrapped everything up as soon as they could so they could go to the pub. I'm all for abrupt endings, but this one is maybe a step too far. Zombie Oral Sex, Blood Quantum. Blood Quantum's tale of a Canadian First Nations reservation battling zombie hordes dropped on Shudder in 2020. Despite its unique premise of the indigenous people being the only ones immune to the undead plague, the horror still hits the usual beats of zombie fiction. But the reservation's resident dickhead Lysol gets a truly cringeworthy end. See, it turns out he's not the best at picking romantic partners, as the secretly infected Lilith transforms into a zombie while they're both alone and proceeds to bite his dick. Off. Obviously badly wounded, this doesn't fully do the character in, and instead he spends the remainder of the movie and his time on Earth deeply injured because, and I do need to stress this once again, a zombie bit his penis off. The Human Experiments, VHS 94. VHS 94 is an absolutely bonkers movie. While it might not be the scariest in the series, it's certainly the goriest. The third segment, The Subject, initially seems like it's going to be a bit of a lull in the action though. Some ropey effects and an overlong opening don't make a good first impression. But where it ends up is frankly mind-blowing, but I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. This shot is told from the perspective of a kidnapped woman who has been experimented on by a mad scientist and transformed into a creature that's part human, part machine. It seems the scientist has watched too much Tetsuo the Iron Man and has kidnapped loads of people and transformed them all into this mix of metal and flesh, to varying degrees of success. As our hero breaks free and brutally murders the corrupt cops who view her not as a victim but a monster, which is all filmed like the best first person shooter game you'll never get to play by the way, she comes across a bunch of these failed attempts, including one poor woman who's been bisected and is lying on an operating table. It's a truly visceral visual, and Knowing this woman is better off dead than in this weird in-between space, our hero unplugs her wires and lets her pass on. 
The Werewolf, The Wolf of Snow Hollow. The Wolf of Snow Hollow is one of the most subversive horror comedies of the last few years. Jim Cummings' flick follows a small town sheriff attempting to solve a series of grisly murders that have seemingly been caused by a werewolf. What's brilliant about the concept is that it initially seems like your regular old horror movie, where these skeptical officers need to be convinced that something supernatural is indeed afoot. This feeling is aided because, unlike the police, the audience actually gets to see these murders happen, and is well aware that a seven-foot wolf is out there eating people. Or is there? I mean, we certainly see a wolf, but it turns out that not everything is as it seems. The ending's big reveal proves that the police were right to be skeptical, as nothing otherworldly was responsible at all. Instead, the killer is a delusional psychopath who dresses up in a convincing werewolf cosplay to live out his weirdest animalistic desires. I mean, who saw that coming? Spears asks Anna to kill him Black Summer. Main characters aren't supposed to die, especially in the realm of TV. After all, how many times have shows lost their lead character and suddenly seen a major drop in viewers? Well, this potential fate did not worry the writers of Z Nation spin-off Black Summer. However, Spears' death in the penultimate episode of season 2 isn't WTF worthy in and of itself, but rather it's the build up to it. See, he's shot in the first episode and spends the remainder of the second season succumbing to his wounds. Rose's daughter Anna is the one to actually put the dying soldier out of his misery as well, hardening herself for the road ahead and letting Spears die happy in the knowledge that Rose, who he cares about deeply, is in safe hands. The main WTF factor surrounding this moment is as a result of of Spears' vast character development across two seasons and 15 episodes. An integral part of Black Summer since the show kicked off, Spears underwent a thorough character examination, with the show delving into his sordid past and journey of redemption. So it was a little bit confusing and truly heartbreaking to see such a rich character depart so prematurely and in such a protracted manner. Margaret Booth's Grizzly End, American Horror Story 1984. It was it was inevitable that American Horror Story would feature in any conversation pertaining to WTF moments. Now, it is human nature to wish an early end to a particularly ghastly on-screen character. However, even those who hated the guts of Margaret Booth in American Horror Story 1984 could not have envisaged such a gruesome fate. Posing under a friendly religious facade, Margaret is later revealed to be none other than the perpetrator of a massacre at a camp that she was alleged to have survived at the cost of her own ear. In reality, she committed the murders, cut off said ear, and then framed the groundskeeper after other campers bullied her. This a baffling twist alone could merit inclusion on this list, but it's Margaret's nauseating end that just about tops it, as her limbs are chopped off and she is decapitated by the camp's vengeful ghosts before her body parts are then thrown into a wood chipper and sprayed off the site of the camp in an attempt to prevent her from returning as one of them, which does not succeed. The Red Room, The Haunting of Hill House. The most bewildering revelation and a WTF moment from Netflix's paranormal extravaganza, The Haunting of Hill House, occurs in what is revealed to be the stomach of the insidious structure. The surprise turn of events is that the so-called Red Room of Hill House, supposedly locked up for years by the way, has actually been open the entire time and malevolently feeding on the family inside. Side. In fact, the room is actually able to morph to suit whatever form will keep a member of the Crane family inside the longest, as that gives the house a longer to feast like a sinister parasite upon them. The Red Room takes many alluring forms for the Cranes then, appearing as the perfect family space for Shirley, a dance studio for Theo, and Luke's childhood treehouse amongst others, all of which play on the characters' loves and are perfectly designed to snare them for more time. The true nature of the mysterious room though is a shocking twist that is almost impossible to see coming, leaving viewers in a state of awestruck shell shock. Dorothy's episode, Servant. In and of itself, Servant is one of those shows that constantly has viewers questioning what on earth they're watching. And that does admittedly tend to happen when famously enigmatic master of deception M. Night Shyamalan is heavily involved in the production of anything. Now, the plot of Servant centers around the Turner family, a husband and wife duo in a crumbling marriage as the result of the accidental death of their infant child, Jericho. Indeed, the only thing that snaps wife Dorothy out of an almost 
vegetative state of grief is the use of a lifelike doll who they name after their deceased son, as Dorothy firmly comes to believe that Jericho is their real child. In arguably the show's most shocking moment to date, Leanne, someone hired to look after Jericho, is locked in a terrifying attic by an unhinged Dorothy after Jericho goes missing. What follows is a legitimately unsettling episode as Dorothy wakes at 2am every night to viciously beat Leanne for information on Jericho's whereabouts as she descends further and further into the depths of manic depravity, saving her most WTF-worthy feet for last as she then buries Leanne alive in the basement. Tyus' shrine, Yellow Jackets. Yellow Jackets has been a major feather in Showtime's illustrious cap. The show itself follows two different timelines. One focused on a group of young victims who survive a plane crash that leaves them stranded in the middle of nowhere, and another set in the future following those same people after they've returned to society and grown older. Now, the show had already revealed that the character of Tyissa had been deeply affected by her time in the wilderness, with her sleepwalking alter ego already displaying a propensity for eating dirt and climbing trees in the middle of the night. Though on the surface she does seem well put together and adjusted, it seems that the character's trauma has been manifesting when she goes to sleep, resulting in a reveal for the ages. After slowly realising the extent of her actions, she finds a ghoulish shrine in the basement of her house, which holds her son Sammy's doll, the decapitated head of the missing family dog, and what appears to be a bloody human heart. The unexplained nature of this macabre reveal made for one of the most memorable blindsides in horror television history. The Acid Toilet Slasher. Aaron Martin's anthology series, that being the appropriately titled Slasher, has flown under the radar in recent years. As each of the seasons have focused on a different unhinged serial killer, Slasher's WTF moments so far kind of reads like some kind of depraved shopping list. However, one demise is notable for the unbelievably gruesome manner in which the killer dispatches his victim. The appalling death in question is perpetrated by the druid in the very first episode of Slash's third season, titled Solstice. The victim in question is Cassidy Olensky, who's trapped in a bathroom cubicle before getting her head dunked in the toilet that is revealed to be full of acid. It's an absolutely nuts a brutal moment, and one nobody saw coming. Lee Chiong San's death all of us are dead. The universally lauded All of Us Are Dead tells the tale of a group of high school students who must fight to survive within their school as a zombie apocalypse breaks out around them. The show's biggest WTF moment comes as protagonist Lee Chiung San seemingly meets a fiery death as he and arch rival Gui Nam are blasted down an elevator shaft by the shockwave from an explosion as the military rain down a firestorm of ordnance. Now, this sudden right turn from the series in seemingly killing off a character that they had spent an entire season building up and encouraging emotional investment in left fans truly gobsmacked. Interestingly though, we never actually see the hero's body, and internet rumblings do indicate that Lee Chiung San may indeed return in some capacity when the second season hits screens, which will probably likely be an even bigger WTF moment than his apparent demise, which is just great stuff. Vecna kills Chrissy, Stranger Things. Stranger Things' Volume 4 brought the series to even bigger heights than before, and part of the appeal of this time around was down to the new ultra-villain Vecna, who terrorised and then brutally murdered Shia leader Chrissy Cunningham to get the new season off to a bang. Now, admittedly, while the series always has had memorable villains, none quite came with the same level of threat as Vecna, who swiftly reveals that he is more than capable of doing devastating damage in a person's mind as his victims snap into a trance in the real world while their minds are transported to a horrendous alternate dimension in which the villain hunts and murders them. Viewers knew from previous scenes that Vecna could torment his victims with nightmarish villains, but this does a little to prepare them for the monstrous villain gouging out Chrissy's eyes and snapping her limbs like matchsticks in an absolutely macabre conclusion to the first episode of Volume 4. 
the congregation drink the poison, Midnight Mass. Once again, it's hard to pick a single WTF moment from a show where the opening episode ends with hundreds of dead cats being washed up on a beach. But one particular abdominable sequence from Midnight Mass does spring to mind, and that of course is the absolutely horrifying scene within the church in the series' penultimate episode. Now, by this point in the show, we've already had the reveal of the quote-unquote angel, the fact that Father Paul is actually feeding his congregation vampire blood, and the death of our main character. But we know things are about to get even more hectic when we go into the church and we see this creature standing around in a priest's robes. After you try and internalize this image, things get even wackier as the majority of the congregation decide to join this angel and transform themselves into vampires, resulting in a demonic massacre inside the church. It's an unreal set piece and home to the most brutal moments of the series. Carl gets bit, The Walking Dead. As you might have expected, The Walking Dead is home to plenty of nuts twists, and it was tempting to put Negan's brutal double murder of Glenn and Abraham on here somewhere. In terms of pure visceral impact, that's definitely the most noteworthy moment, but if we're talking pure what the hell did I just watch reactions, it's actually the death of Carl Grimes that stands out the most. And that's because the death of Glenn especially was anticipated for years. It happens the same way in the comics, and while Abraham dying alongside was a surprise, that also didn't come out of nowhere. Carl being killed off though absolutely did. Not only does the younger Grimes ultimately become the main character of the comic book with a whole bunch of storylines centering around him that the show ultimately discarded, but even his actor Chandler Riggs was reportedly blindsided by the decision of the TV show's writers. And in practice, not only does Carl go out in a lame way being bit by a random walker, but it was one of the dumbest decisions of the entire show. Going for shock factor over long-term plotting, Carl's death to many was the final straw of this post-apocalyptic show. Fear Street Part 1, 1994, Kate's Demise a fiercely loyal and brave friend to the movie's core cast members, the shock factor derived from Kate's demise was largely due to her popularity amongst the picture's fan base. Nobody wants to see their favourite character die in exceedingly harrowing fashion, but that's exactly what happened here. The climactic sequences of Fear Street Part 1 1994 sees our protagonists attempting to fend off the resurrected shady side killers. Despite her best efforts to defend Dina and Sam from their pursuers, Kate bites the dust in such jaw-dropping fashion that she she earned Deb Meets 2022 Golden Chainsaw for best kill. After being stabbed by Skull Mask, Schmidt is then pushed headfirst through an industrial bread slicer for one of the most gruesome ends in recent memory. Santa's Slay Meet Santa 2005 Santa's Slay is a slasher comedy which sees Saint Nick's usual characteristics somewhat altered. WWE wrestler Bill Goldberg's take on the beaming personification of Christmas is actually the result of a virgin birth spawned by Satan himself. The 25th of December was traditionally his day of slaying, an opportunity to wreak bloody havoc upon anyone unfortunate enough to cross his path until he lost a wager to an angel who promptly sentenced him to deliver presents for a thousand years instead. Unfortunately for the the materialistic Mason family, Santa celebrates the lapsing of his mandate by carrying out one of the most hilariously brutal massacres in slasher history. Punting the family dog with a ceiling fan after exploding out of the chimney like the Kool-Aid man on PCP, Goldberg's character proceeds to dispatch his latest victims in comically savage fashion. It's hard to pick a highlight between drowning the Mason matriarch in eggnog or using a Christmas tree ornament as a throwing star to impale her fleeing daughter. The remainder of Santa's sleigh sadly never lives up to the opening sequence sequences sheer WTF factor though. But this magnificently insane introduction remains one of the more memorable WTF moments ever witnessed for the subgenre. My bloody Valentine, Mabel gets tumble dried. An outrageously violent outing that notoriously had nine minutes of footage censored by the Motion Picture Association of America, 1981's cult classic My Bloody Valentine was always going to make an appearance on a list of this variety. The Canadian slasher chronicles a berserker-esque killing spree against the backdrop of Valentine's Day, perpetrated by a charming individual decked out in mining gear. Said individual produces a number of spectacularly grisly kills across 93 blood-soaked minutes, but nothing tops an early murder in 
terms of sheer WTF factor, an impressive state of affairs considering that the death in question actually takes place off screen. Elderly laundromat owner Mabel Osborne has a card delivered to her containing an ominous play on a classic Valentine's Day poem, before being murdered by the shadowy killer. It's actually the discovery of Mabel's corpse that usually elicits a swathe of F-bombs. Police chief Newby finds Osborne's grotesque remains stuffed into a still-running dryer, reduced to a withered crisp by the heat of the machine. It's such a horrifying visual that the fact that Mabel has had her heart cut out by the killer is somehow reduced to somewhat of a nauseating footnote. A Nightmare on Elm Street, Death by Mattress Introducing fright fans to the dream-haunting child killer Freddy Krueger, 1984's A Nightmare on Elm Street follows the supernatural murderer's first selection of victims, the children of a group of parents who burned Krueger alive after discovering his heinous crimes. The original entry in the series also provides one of the more curse-inducing kill sequences in horror history. The gruesome murder features none other than a baby-faced Johnny Depp in his feature film debut, taking on the role of lead protagonist Nancy Thompson's boyfriend, Glenn. Modern viewers may roll their eyes, but at the time of the film's release, every single aspect of Glenn's demise must have seemed beyond disturbing. Freddy's tongue snaking out of the telephone receiver as he taunts Nancy in the moments preceding Glenn's death is WTF worthy in and of itself, but the shockingly gruesome manner of Depp's character's end sets the bar to a whole new level. Blissfully slumbering away, Glenn is suddenly sucked into his mattress by Kruger. His mother opens the door to be greeted with the sight of a literal fountain of blood and gore, erupting out of her deceased son's bed like a volcano on the plains of hell. Motel Hell, Vincent Smoked Meats Believe it or not, the fact that Motel Hell's primary antagonist Vincent Smith eventually dons a literal pig's head over his own as a mask doesn't even constitute the 1980 cult classic's most disquieting instance. That dark honour is reserved for the satirical slasher's Secret Garden, a gruesome spectacle that plays a pivotal role in the film's narrative. Motel Hell follows the aforementioned Smith and his younger sister Ida, a pair of abhorrent killers who abduct and murder passers-by before serving them up as a local delicacy. Vincent is renowned in the area for the excellent quality of his smoked meats. The Smiths' unfortunate victims have their vocal cords sliced to prevent them from screaming for help before they are planted up to their necks like a horrifying assortment of human carrots. Their captors then feed their crops to keep them plump and healthy up until the point that they are ready for harvest. And no prizes for guessing what that entails. I know what you did last summer, Helen Shivers bites the dust. Sarah Michelle Gellar's Helen Shivers was the breakout star of 1997's I Know What You Did Last Summer, a seminal slasher offering following a group of young friends who were stalked by a hook-handed murderer. Effortlessly blowing Jennifer Love Hewitt's wailing lead Julie James out of the water, Shivers is contentiously the most iconic non-final girl in horror history, the beauty pageant winner who still possessed an unshakable will to survive. As such, the fact that it is Helen who bites the dust as opposed to her hysterical counterpart has left fans cursing their fortune to this day. Furthermore, the manner of Shiver's death is so unfair that it would be almost comical if it wasn't such a devastating sequence. This is a woman who quite literally kicked out the window of a police car and jumped from a building's third floor to make her escape, only for director Jim Gillespie to do away with his beloved character anyway. The killer catches up with Helen mere feet from safety, brutally slashing her to death as her desperate screams are drowned out by a passing marching band. The burning, Cropsy goes rafting. The Burning follows the murderous exploits of Cropsy, a caretaker who was hideously burned in a prank gone wrong and presumed dead. Cropsy soon returns to wreak bloody havoc on the nearby camp Stonewater, where he goes on to become the perpetrator of arguably the most WTF-worthy massacre that horror audiences of the time had ever witnessed. After canoes go missing from Stonewater, several camp members improvise a raft and paddle off in search of them. They soon discover one of the missing canoes, only for a homicidal Cropsy to suddenly emerge from the boat and butcher them all, using nothing but a pair of pruning shears. Legendary horror prosthetics artist Tom Savini's mastery is on full display as severed fingers go flying and blood spurts from a litany of nauseating wounds against the backdrop of the doomed character's desperate screams. Contemporary viewers may snigger, but at the time of the burning's release, this was about as harrowingly violent as anything that had ever been seen on screen. House of Wax, Wade's Death 
The most shocking death in 2005's House of Wax is undoubtedly that of Jared Padalecki's Wade. Committing the cardinal horror sin of becoming separated from the film's core group, Wade is soon ambushed by Vincent, one half of the murderous fraternal duo, who subdues him by gruesomely slicing through his Achilles tendon. Things only get worse for Wade from there. Vincent encases his agonised victim in molten wax before arranging him as an exhibit in the twins' nightmarish museum. Wade is eventually discovered by his friend Dalton, who attempts to remove the covering from his stricken companion, but succeeds only in peeling off his skin. As anguished tears stream silently down Wade's cheeks, Vincent sneaks up on Dalton. While his initial blow misses its intended target, the killer's vicious swing slashes off half of Wade's frozen face instead. Rather unsurprisingly, the unfortunate young man proceeds to die of shock from his ordeal soon after. Psycho, the Cellar Contentiously the first true slasher film ever made, it could be argued that Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho represented one gigantic WTF moment for cinema upon its release. Utilising an unprecedented combination of graphic sexuality and violence, audiences had quite literally never seen anything like the master of suspense's depraved masterpiece. The 1960 outing chronicles the disappearance of fugitive embezzler Marion Crane from a motel run by one Norman Bates and the macabre series of events that follow. While the movie's most iconic sequence is undoubtedly the scene in which Crane is murdered in the shower by a shadowy figure, Psycho's most WTF-worthy instance comes when her sister discovers the nightmarish truth behind her sister's disappearance. Attempting to hide in the cellar of Bates' residence, she comes face to face with Norman's mother, finally unmasked as nothing more than a mummified corpse. However, Hitchcock wasn't quite done there. As Vera Miles' protagonist screams her head off in horror, she's confronted with an even more disturbing sight when the figure behind her sister's murder appears is in the cellar doorway. It's none other than Bates himself wearing a dress and a wig to complement his dementedly unhinged smile as he charges towards Leela with a knife. While Bates is thankfully subdued by John Gavin's Sam Loomis in the nick of time, Psycho's cellar sequence remains a front-runner for the most seminal WTF moment in the history of the horror genre. 